If you're someone with a lot of interests and who likes playing with a lot of different people or in a lot of different styles or, or things like that, um, I can see the freelance lifestyle as being something that's more um, has more possibilities to it if, if you're that person who has, has all those interests. Less opportunity for burnout, which unfortunately we see all too often in a, in a symphonic situation. So um, it's pretty great. And you never know what's going to come out of a freelance job. Today's guest is somebody that has been recommended time and time again, and he actually lives here in the San Francisco Bay Area with me. I'm so pleased to bring you this conversation with Michael today. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contraries Conversations, and talk about a cool career. Michael today balances being a conductor, running a music school, playing principal bass for a ton of orchestras, teaching base. Uh, it's it's a full plate for sure. How the heck does he do it? We talk about that. How much is too much? And we talk about that. What's it like being an Airbnb super host? We even talk about that. This is an incredibly fun conversation. Michael is a, a very well-spoken and engaging person. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Steve Swan, String Bass, Colstein Music, D'Addario Strings, and Upton Bass. More on them later, but let's dive into this conversation with Michael today. I, can you just go through the suite of activities that you find yourself engaged with professionally the, the, with the, the uh, crowd in and the bass jobs and everything? I think that'd be an interesting place to start. Absolutely. So I, I feel like I have this... Uh, Generally speaking, pretty good balance between performance and education and on some level administration as well. So you mentioned the Crowd, Crowd and Music Center. For those who don't know, the Crowd and Music Center in Berkeley is a, a wonderful, unique day school, fourth through eighth grade, where we start every day with two hours of music with strings, chamber music as our principal focus. And we also have community programs, so private lessons, chamber music coaching for little kids through adult amateurs, a Suzuki program, lots of things that are pretty fantastic, uh, summer camps. So we do all that kind of thing. And I'm director of artistic administration for Crowden, which is a fancy sounding title, but basically my duties, uh, it can be a little bit of a catch-all job. I take care of a lot of things where I fill in the gaps at Crowden, but I also run our outreach programs. So in fact, we've got a rather high impact public school in Oakland, title one school, almost everyone gets free reduced price lunch, but they've got a strings program there and we're helping to support that. So uh, that's that's a lot of what I do administratively there at Crowden, but I'm also coaching chamber music, teaching a bass class and conducting orchestras on a pretty daily basis there. Okay. That in and of itself <laughs> sounds like a, a full-time job or at least a very, very active job. It is a pretty active job, and, and thankfully they've been uh, they've allowed me to have the flexibility to go and do some things when I need to do them. So, for example, last year I played in the first edition of a new classical music festival in Havana, Cuba, and said, "Oh, by the way, I won't be here for a week." And we were able to work that out, and that was a pretty exciting thing to to get to do. I'm I'm hoping to do that again this November. Uh, it's always a little tricky going to Cuba, but performing artists are, are generally speaking able to to do that. But crowd for now has said okay as long as you can get your work done we can uh we can cover for you when when you're not around uh so that's so that's just the crowd and part of it but i also teach for some other organizations the golden gate philharmonic in san francisco where i also do some conducting uh the young people symphony orchestra where i'm their double bass sectional coach and then the palo alto chamber orchestra where i'm a guest conductor each year and i just got back from teaching in their chamber music intensive which is always one of my most magical weeks of the year basically eight in the morning until 10 at night a uh, multifaceted thing taking the kids of this youth orchestra which is a youth orchestra after my own heart a string uh, five level string orchestra but with chamber music at its core so on every concert there are small ensembles and and we start the year off with an intensive where you get an ensemble who will work on one movement. You'll coach them. I also led the chorus there. And then we have some senior faculty members like me and then some kind of younger faculty members, fellows who come in, probably recent master's degrees from conservatories.
repertories. And there's a wonderful teacher training aspect to it. Again, all about chamber music coaching. So even though there are these crazy 14 hour days and I'm exhausted, it's, it's really fulfilling as well. And that's Powell's old chamber orchestra. That's and Peco, Peco. is that right? Okay. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I thought. Okay. That's Peco. So, uh, so just got back from Peco camp. Um, but I'm playing as well. Next week I'm doing a Tristan and Isolde in concert. I did the Schwabacher debut concert with San Francisco Opera Center this, this summer, uh, played at my usual Mendocino music festival, which I love. I spend the middle two weeks of July in this magical place playing principal bass there. And then my regular season is going to start up. So I've got about five orchestras where I'm consistently the principal player and I also have my left coast chamber ensemble so if you haven't noticed yet chamber music is uh the first and greatest love and it's kind of tough to make that work as a double bassist but I just uh always try to expand the definition. So actually, for example, at Peco Camp, I was coaching the Dumka movement from the Dvorak Opus 51 quartet, and there was a young bassist playing the cello part. And I do this all the time at, at Peco Camp. I was uh, playing in our faculty fellow ensemble doing the first movement of Souvenir de Florence, and I just play that. It's one of my parlor tricks. I tend to play that at pitch. I mean, you can't get all of the quadruple stops in, but it's something, it's something that I do. And so all of those things that would be so easy in first position on the cello, well, it's, you know, kind of a different ball game on the bass. And this, this young bassist who is doing the, the Dvorak was, uh, he was kind of playing everything at the bass pitch when he could. And then if he didn't have a low D or a low C, he'd take it up. And I said, okay, let's, let's talk about voice leading. Let's talk about where this is going to sound good. And while I didn't have him playing everything at pitch. Some of that really wouldn't have worked. He was really game for it and did a beautiful job of uh, doing something that I feel fortunate to get to do every summer, which is poach chamber music from the cello repertoire and, and expand our own. When did you get into chamber music? When did that, did that start? And, and, you know, I, uh, I'd love to get into your backstory, but was that during your time at Juilliard or after that, or when did that? Well, it's an it's an interesting thing. So actually, my my Juilliard experience, um, I actually only went to Juilliard pre college. I'm I have a I have a pretty awesome music career, but without a single degree in music. I uh, <laughs> I, I I did get my diploma from Juilliard pre college, but when I was deciding where to go to school afterwards, I, I contemplated going to Juilliard and doing the conservatory thing, but I ended up going. Um, I had a couple of other nice offers from from Harvard and Columbia and decided to stay in New York City to to stay with my teacher Homer Mensch. Um ironically I could have I could have registered for lessons with either Julius Levine or Don Palma, who were just sort of adjunct faculty at Columbia while I was there. <laughs> but no, I was in New York for Homer Mensch. Uh, but I also went to the Superlative University, um, was in New York City at a time when a lot of people think of it as maybe, I mean, not quite the lowest of the low. It was the 80s. It wasn't, it wasn't the 70s. It wasn't quite taxi driver New York City, <laughs> but it was, it was still, <laughs> it had its rough edges, but uh, I loved it. I grew up about 25 miles out, in, out of New York City and was always in the city's thrall. So anyway, just coming around um, to, to, to where I did this, I, sorry, my, my stories are always really circular, but I'll get to this. That's okay. <laughs> but I, uh, so Juilliard pre-college, I loved already. I was playing in the orchestra there. It's phenomenal um, for a high school student. It was, it was such an exciting thing. But I remember having had a, um, a trout quintet opportunity while I was there. I think it was probably my junior year of high school with just this awesome starry group of musicians like Beyond Sang, who's teaching at, at, at UT Austin now on cello, and Gustavo Romero. I think Gustavo's maybe in San Diego or, or maybe he's at another Texas university. Fabulous pianist, great group. And, um, and that sort of got me thinking, hey, this is something I could do. And then I started looking for the chamber music repertory for bass, and it was, you know, very short or larger groups, you know, septets, octets. But that was always kind of in the back of my mind. And I brought up Columbia as well because my sophomore year, we were living in a, a residential suite um, that was music themed. And uh, one of my suite mates there brought some friends over. She grew up in New York City and she's a violinist. And she said, oh, well, let's have some chamber music reading. So some of her friends came over. We were reading some things. I was probably reading cello parts. I don't remember what it was at the time. And this cellist turns to me. I'm not even sure who she is. And she said, oh, wow, you, you sound terrific. You know, what is it you want to do with your life? And I just, I was in this sort of mood where I said, I want to play with the New York Philharmonic. And she said, <laughs> no, you don't. And I thought... <laughs> Such a front rate. Now, if anyone's listening there from the New York Philharmonic, I'd be delighted to play with you sometime. <laughs> like, no offense. But I think she was hearing something about my approach that was not about, oh, 
you know, let's get that big symphonic job and, and I'll be happy there forever. Uh, you know, maybe that could have happened and maybe that could have been, but I feel like what I have found myself doing is a, a better fit for me, better fit for my uh, varied interests, my musicianship, and also just, you know, keeping it, um, keeping it small when uh when i when i can so also I, I i one of the groups i play with here is the san francisco chamber orchestra and uh we've got a pretty active schedule so i would say that that's uh that really feeds me too i i even though it's orchestral i'm generally speaking the only bassist there and and again bassists out there who are listening i love playing with other bassists <laughs> but there is uh there is a real a real joy in just being able to shape the phrase in your own way and you know you can try doing that as a principle too and bringing everyone along for the 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 ride but thankfully uh everyone does have their own personality and and we're all richer for it when you're playing in a section and people have a number of different perspectives but you know getting all those perspectives to align in a way that sounds good is um you know is, is sometimes part of the symphonic challenge so i do some of that with with a number of orchestras here but again it's not uh you know it's not 100% of uh, of what i'm doing we, and um and again that that suits me that fits me pretty well yeah, it's such a different skill set uh, and and perspective being the one bass player in a group. I played in this uh, chamber music group called Midsummer's Music for 15 years back in, in the Chicago area. And yeah, it always struck me after a year of largely orchestral playing to all of a sudden is like is like a total rather than trying to blend with five other bass players or seven other bass players and where's that low g and everything they get just this refreshing and sort of musically rewarding uh role i just had such a great time doing that absolutely and, and like you're saying you know finding that low g or even worse that low g sharp <laughs> with everyone else in this section this time you get to lay it down you yeah. said okay ladies and gentlemen this is where g sharp is <laughs> Let's build the chord on me. So there is, there is, uh, you know, there's something really nice about generally speaking playing on the tonic when whenever you get an opportunity. So uh, that's uh, that's one of the the joys of it. I I know people who've seen me play or, or have played with me. Um, sometimes enjoy, sometimes enjoy less the um, the degree of physical engagement that I have with my mm -hmm. my playing. Some might even describe it as being a little bit flamboyant sometimes, but you know, it's who I am. I get to express myself. And even in a symphonic setting, uh, I'm kind of all in all the time. And I remember sitting with a bass player at Mendocino who, um, wonderful player. I mean, super clean. It was perfect, but again, a little more just the facts, ma'am, in terms of his appearance when he'd play. And, you know, I, th I think just the scope of what he do, but again, excellent, excellent, clean player. And, you know, I just, by way of excusing myself said, you know, I'm sorry. I I I, you know, I picked the double bass because I love ensemble playing. And I, when I was picking the instrument, everyone needed a bass player, so I had lots of opportunities to play with everyone else. But I realize now that what I am is a string quartet, first violinist trapped in a double bassist's <laughs> body. And you know, I just it just kind of popped out like that. And then the the guy said, "Yeah, yeah I think that's that's pretty much right. <laughs> that's, that's kind of who you are." So uh, so yeah, and and again, if. If I were that, you know, string quartet first violin is trapped in double bassist body and I was always running into some flack for it or I was always playing in a symphonic situation where, you know, that, you know, inner Arnold Steinhardt couldn't come out, uh, it, it might be more frustrating for me. But fortunately, I do have all these chamber music outlets and um, so much work with San Francisco Chamber Orchestra and just a lot of other opportunities which tend to be a, a little smaller in scope. So again, you know, those people who get those big symphonic jobs, these are superlative organizations, but generally speaking, you're, you're molding your playing to be, you know, one of eight or one of nine. And like you were saying with your experience, um, you know, to be molding your experience to be one of one, uh, or one of two, it's, it's a, it's a very different skill set. You know, the, uh, I think you mentioned when you were describing the position at Crowden, but singing has also been a been a part of your life and is a part of your life to talk about that it's it's been more a part of my life i i um i'd like to do more of it i think i'm so busy i i can't necessarily make it happen all the time i also was someone 
uh, I'm like probably 60% of men, I'm in that baritone range, and uh, a lot of the beauty in my voice tended to be, especially when I was younger, in the, in the upper part of the staff, but I was never this high flyer who was going to go out there and pop out seven high seas in a row. I was never that guy. <laughs> but just as people need double basses, people need tenors. So I found myself cast in uh, a number of things that, that worked well for me. I, I sang Candide, I sang the Alma Viva and Barbara of Seville. Uh, my voice can move well, so I was kind of a foolish lyric tenor and um now as i'm i'm aging i feel like i'm going through the changes and i'm i'm more just kind of a lyric baritone <laughs> uh but you know if, if i if i need to if i need to push it up there a little higher i i can but um it's hard to sustain a high tessitura but uh, i did a little bit of opera stuff in my early 30s and um the things that i've done more recently have tended to be concert things oratorio things or or recital things and uh that was something you know we we all sing and i just love singing and i i love opera so one of my my first big professional break was actually playing principal bass with the lyon opera orchestra in in france and i had um that had come about because I was I was living here in California. I came out here for graduate work. As I said before, I didn't do degrees in music. I did my undergraduate degree in history at Columbia and not knowing exactly what to do next, but suspecting I might find my way into music, I thought, hmm, what's what's the next thing to do? Well, I'm you know, I'm good at school. I like the university environment. Let's do some more of that. <laughs> so I, I, I came out and started a PhD program at UC Berkeley in, in American history. And while I was out here, because I can't only do one thing, I started playing for people around uh, around the area. And I played for Kent Nagano in an audition that lasted about 10 minutes just to be on the sub list at Berkeley Symphony. And I thought, oh, well, that didn't go so well. And turns out it went pretty well because Kent asked me to go for uh, basically the, the remainder of a season to Lyon and be principal bassist in the, in the opera orchestra there. And uh, it kind of stuck. What, what started as a seven-month commitment turned into the better part of a seven-year commitment. I, I lived in Lyon for, for three years full-time and another four years of going back and forth between California and France. That was kind of the best part, having this, this jet-set orchestra career. But we played with some really stellar, stellar artists, uh, José Van Damme and Sophie Van Otter, people like that, and um, some really interesting productions, but also it was a, quite an excellent orchestra, so we would do symphonic things in our own right. There were also some some chamber music activities, so pretty great job. Uh, and I, I was never like full-time tenured there. I had some season contracts, and then, like I said, I had those four years of just coming in and doing doing it on a, on a project basis. And so sometimes people ask, you know, well, you know, like, like why Why'd you come back? And uh, I don't know. I, um, it was wonderful living in Lyon. It's an excellent orchestra. But at the time, uh, at the time that I was doing it, I was in this long distance relationship. And then, as it turns out, we were so, so much better at long distance stuff than, <laughs> than, 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 than living together, as right. you discover. But you know, you can only figure that out once you actually try that that cohabitation thing. And it turns out, we were we were kind of lousy at that. But hey. You know, uh, d d you know, bygones. So, but it's 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 good to be um, it's good to be back. It's good to be doing. And uh, like, you might get the impression that I like doing lots of different things. And if I had been just full time there in Lyon, well, it'd be hard to do lots of different things. Again, it would be that 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 full time job that maybe maybe isn't the best fit for me. This episode is brought to you by the Upton Bass String Instrument Company, a company that I have been such a fan of over the years. Gary and Eric and all the good folks at Upton, they do extraordinary work. They've been at it for a long time, and it has been so much fun to watch them evolve over the years. And a question they get asked a lot is, what's the difference between their bohemian model bass and their standard model bases. And basically what it boils down to is they, they come from the same basic outline, but there's much more customization available in a Bohemian base. So Upton standard bases basically look like each other. They're either laminate, hybrid, or carved, but they're similar in their form while you can get your bohemian base customized if you want hat peg tuners you if you want all sorts of other details that's the base you can customize and if you haven't been to the upton website recently they're constantly adding new videos new photos new descriptions and every base has a story and i love following along with these stories Visit them at UptonBase.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. As I think 
over the years, how many times I've used Colstein products. It's just amazing. I look at my base right now, which has on the same bib that I bought while in high school. That's a Colstein's bib. I can't believe that this thing is still kicking, but I have my pencils and my rosin and all those other accessories in my bib. And when I look inside my bib, I see my Colstein rosin, which Peter Lloyd and so many other bass players use. I enjoy their ultra rosin. And I have my Colstein instrument cleaner that I've used for years and years to keep my bass looking good and clean. They've got Veracore strings, which Michael Klinghoffer loves to use, especially on student basses. They've got quivers, stands, so much more. Learn more about their accessories, their beautiful pedigree instruments, and so much more at Colstein.com. Okay, so, so many directions we could go. I want to talk about all these many things, but I, I want to before before it slips my mind. I uh, Homer Mensch. Mm -hmm. I work with Homer Mensch, and I've talked to a lot of people on the podcast that that have studied with him at some point. So, favorite memories of studying with him? What was he like? Any stories that come to mind? Well, it, you know, it's it's interesting, and I've talked with other people, and. and People have described to me some of their experiences studying with other teachers, not necessarily bassists, but where I sense there's this kind of like Stockholm syndrome where it sounds really awful, but you're going to keep going through it. You're going <laughs> to keep going through it. And then you join the cult. And I, I feel like I did that a little bit with Mr. Mensch. I mean, I, I loved him and I knew that all the respect was there. But, you know, when I first started studying with him, I, you know, I just get these sorts of things like he's like, there you are, just flailing at that instrument. I mean, really, he would literally say things like that. And I would, you know, here I am, this this high school boy, keep it together, keep it together. And then, like, the tears would flow as soon as I'd, I'd leave the lesson. So these don't sound like favorite memories necessarily, but I, as I look back on it, um, I think it was, it was great to have a teacher like that who was, who was so demanding uh, in, in, in so many ways. Um, and then... When I did just get it more together as a player, um, just it was, you know, he still had a, a critical side to it, but um, it was all about the support. It was he was just kind of old school, and that was mm -hmm. his approach. And I, I remember when I did, uh, when I did my Juilliard audition, um, he was he was there in the room, of course, as one of the faculty members, and you had you know John Schaefer looking all stoic, I think, with like literally like an unlit stogie hanging out of his <laughs> mouth, and and David Walter and. Um, I can't remember who else was there. Oren wasn't teaching there yet, but um, but Homer was there, kind of sitting slightly behind them, kind of like coaching me on like giving me these little things, you know. And you're you're trying to <laughs> you're trying to concentrate and just play your Dittersdorf and just lay it down. And it went fine. I mean, I got in. It. It, right. it was great. But 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 uh, I, I thought that was uh, I thought that was very touching. And I do. There was one thing where, you know, like any teacher, you'll repeat the same thing over and over again. And he was. He had this thing that he would do about uh, grabbing the string, getting a clear articulation to begin with. And he would talk about pinching the string, which actually, and pinching the bow, which was more, I think, more applicable, applicable to French bow rather than, than German bow. It's kind of more his thing, although there's, there's, there's a pinching element that goes on with it. But I just remember lesson after lesson where he would just be, I'd be playing something, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, it might have been... This is something that was on the string and kind of detaché, but with some separation. He wanted clarity. And just in the lesson, he'd be saying, pinch, 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 pinch. <laughs> and, which sounds ridiculous, but I had this great affection for it. And I find myself, even with really little kids, because like I said, Crowden starts uh, in fourth grade. I will begin kids who are, you know, playing on a, um, a fourth student cello, for example. And I just, I, I like to be really holistic and rather than say, okay, just pluck the strings. I said, no, let's, let's, let's figure out how the bow works as well as, as well as your left hand. And, you know, I have found myself asking kids to pinch. I, I don't just repeat the word pinch 12 times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've evolved a little from that, but it's, it's, it's great to have that. And certainly, um, you know, the, there has been this sort of idea, sort of truism that, that the German bow is this power bow and that the French bow is the finesse bow. And I think um, there are all sorts of nationalistic stereotypes that are, that are tied up in that. And I can say that Homer Mensch was an absolutely fabulous double bassist and had one of the biggest sounds I have ever heard as a French bow player with, of course, that, you know, perfect clarity of articulation with right. all that pinching that was going right. on, but then could, <laughs> could, could just pull the deepest, richest sound out of the bass. And it had nothing to do with it being German or French bow. And as 
primarily a German boat player, I I take some umbrage at the notion that we'd be um, all sort of rough edges and and power. The fact is, it's uh, a bozo boat. There there are different approaches to it, but they behave. Um, in very similar ways, and you have to adapt your technique to do whatever you need to do, whether it's about putting a lot of power out there or playing something with a lot of finesse. That's just, mm-hmm. uh, and and certainly certainly Homer Mensch had had all of that, yeah. but you know with a with a with a somewhat <laughs> difficult side. But it was good. It was it was a really good growth opportunity for me as a high school student. So uh, the the school year starting. Mm-hmm. Which means that you're, you're every and this, the orchestra season starting, and so you're going to be ramping up or are ramping up, you know, here as we as we get into the fall. So maybe a, as a, a way to start by exploring like how you balance all this stuff. Like, can you just give us a week in the life of Michael today? Like, what what as in September? Like, with with whether it's Berkeley Symphony or whatever group and Crowden and the various groups you say, like what's, what's a week look like for you? Well, you know, it, it really varies. There are yeah. some weeks where, uh, you, you know, the general contours will involve teaching from eight to 10 in the morning at Crowden. And mm-hmm. then I'll have certain other responsibilities that I, I have to do there. Uh, Golden Gate Philharmonic, once that starts up, that'll be four thirty to seven on, on, on Tuesdays. Again, I'll sub out of that from time to time. Um, I'm doing, a uh, when I'm guest conducting at Peco, that's going to happen a, a few months in, so that's going to take up my my Wednesday. So I have these overlays that are there. Plus, uh, my private teaching I've been doing on um, Saturday morning chamber music coaching through crowd and through through the um, community programs there. So I know that's all there, and then I take the performance overlay, and uh, that's when the juggling act begins. That's when I say, okay. I need to sub out of this. Can you cover me here? Can we do that? And all the time maintaining, uh, maintain, it, it's a challenge sometimes to maintain the, 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 the quality of what you do. I mean, I try not to spread myself too thin, but for example, I let private students know, Hey, it'll be great to work together. Let's set this, you know, day and time, but let's be fully aware that that's going to change a lot. And then I give them flexibility as well. You know, every, every moment where I've said, you know, I, I can't believe I'm reorganizing my whole life for a fifth grader. Well, <laughs> I asked that, I asked that fifth grader's family to, to do that for me. So, so, so it's a two way street. So it depends upon the week. Uh, you know, I try to have that, um, that basic, that, that basic template there. Um, and then most rehearsals will be in the evenings, although not always, if it's a San Francisco chamber orchestra week, for example, um, we'll have, you know, about five rehearsals during the day and then going into the weekend with the, um, the evening concerts. So that takes some juggling Berkeley symphony, mostly in afternoon and evening. So that's a little more flexible. That'll have more of an impact on, on private lessons. Um, occasional recording things come up and then, lots of things need to to be subbed out of um it's just you know as anyone who freelances knows it can be um it can be a challenge i'm i'm going to be i was asked by a composer to record a string quintet of his just a single movement with with the um the del sol quartet and it looks like it's all going to work but it's during a berkeley symphony week so i know looking at that week that even with the and that'll be early October. So first week of October, uh, you know, if any of you out there are thinking about engaging me for something in the first week of October, <laughs> don't <laughs> because I'm booked solid. But even, you know, figuring out that rehearsal time in the previous week, but, but the previous week actually wasn't so full. So, th- so that's how it is. It can be, um, I don't want to say feast or famine, but th- there are these, uh, um, it comes in waves. I, cu- I couldn't sustain a week like that first week in October every single week or i couldn't sustain a week like the week i just had at peco camp every week i you know i can't work from eight in the morning till 10 at night but there are some weeks that are like that where it's uh you know from you know start of the day until something something rather late and you're you're just you're just running around uh the nice thing about peco camp was we were all just in a camp and you could mm-hmm. walk to everything there's the the added joy in the bay area of getting into a car and <laughs> trying to make it to places on time yeah not fun <laughs> <laughs> how was that in chicago was there was traffic could be rough there too yeah or? it's very similar yeah the, there's no snow here mm-hmm. and it's prettier to look at you right. i'm looking at the bay or i'm looking at palm trees or i'm looking at at hills so there's more variety uh but it's it's very similar leave you know leave two and a half hours early for right. something you know right. and generally you're fine uh but yeah that like 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 most musicians, I would spend a lot of my life in the car. And I mean, you're, you're describing uh, a lot of 
10 to 15 hour days there right yeah, i mean yeah. that's a that's especially if you're going for eight and you've got a rehearsal at night you right. so like how much how how do you keep how do you keep burnout from not happening this is something i think about a lot like i i definitely like you i like to be involved in lots of different projects but i've definitely like said whoops jason like like too much like like how do you how do you guard against that you've been doing this a long time so i'm assuming you've you've uh, got <laughs> got some got some strategies i, I you know I, me, I don't I, I don't know that i do necessarily i mean i i do feel like sometimes i neglect certain things in my in my personal life or taking care of myself it's like oh i just you know ate out seven times this week or yeah. something like that i'd much rather have control over you know my own cooking but there's just no time yeah. you know, so, so i i think the i think it's just it's just worked it's worked out pretty well in that you know you'll have an intense week or two like that and then the next week there'll be a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. And so I'll take the time. And again, Crowden's had some flexibility too. Sometimes, um, sometimes I'll take a nap, you know, that, I mean, that's, yeah. it's not, it's not the, it's not the, not the worst thing to do. Um, things have changed so much. I remember when I was in kindergarten, we had our little mats and we were supposed to lie down and take a nap. And I was a five-year-old kid and I just did not want to take that nap. And now as a 53-year-old kid, I'm just like, <laughs> bring on that nap, please. Let's have scheduled nap time. Let's bring that back. That's the, that's my, you know, if I were president, uh, that's what I would institute. <laughs> if I were dictator, <laughs> everyone take a nap now. But uh, so so that's that's part of it. Um, I'm trying to find some better balance before. I mean, uh, when you came over today, uh, you know, I showed you my my Airbnb that I've just created downstairs. So I'm adding in addition to, you know, musician and, you know, the, the singer and educator and administrator. I've added um, hotelier to my list of... <laughs> <laughs> professions and i mean it's a little grandiose it's just it's just the one unit but so far going like gangbusters uh and um it's it's fun it was the the creative process of creating the space downstairs was really fun and doing something a little different that way finding something else uh to to do is 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 nice having that kind of outlet but what i'm looking forward to of course i have to pay down my investment of the the line of credit which I use to build the place but it's um it's given me another income stream and I feel like that's the sort of thing where I might be able to get out of that freelancer mindset of oh it fits in my schedule I'll take the job mm -hmm. you know I I might sometimes just say you know I'll pass on on this one I I don't feel like I do that enough I mean on, on occasion I've turned something down because I I I don't really feel like it but that generally doesn't happen usually i've I, i've had to turn something down simply because i couldn't make it work yeah. in my schedule and you know that's that's the freelancers conundrum you know, I, I have a number of contracts with certain orchestras but those by themselves don't rise to a level of activity that i want in terms of my right. performing career so i i do feel like i the first answer has to be Yes, most of the most of the time. You know, I still s struggle with this, and I know I got to get out of the habit because I, I think that's something that at least for myself when, when I got into freelancing, I was just constantly worried that everything would fall apart and I'd have nothing. And after I did, I did, I did seven years of full time freelancing. Sounds like an oxymoron, but I was full time yeah. freelancing. And after about year four, I'm like, oh, I guess it works. But I still, I still to this day, like I look two two three months out and I see blank space on my calendar and I get this anxiety. You really stress out. Yeah. Right. Does that still happen to you? That still happens to okay. me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been putting my calendar together for the year, and there are some busy spots, but there are lots, lots of blank spots that I know will fill in. Yeah. I mean, there, there, were, there were times when I didn't have these contracts, and I'd go into it on this leap of faith, and, and it always worked out. Yeah. So I know it's there, but yeah, there's that, there's that little worry. That's, there's that little concern. And certainly in, you know, in this concert music field, in classical music, which we love so much, um, the, the, it's... The business model for it uh, is changing, and it's not as apparent uh, as it was. And we can't just sit back and let everyone do it all for us. We 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 have to know that orchestras um, can and do go under, and they're uh, th you know at all levels. I mean, they they can be from from an orchestra that has a five hundred thousand dollar a year budget to honestly, as we've seen, orchestras with. 50 million a year budgets, but which, which run deficits every year. So it's, um, you know, that, that challenge is real. And I think we, as musicians have to, um, we have to be evangelists for the music we love and we, we, we have to, we have to keep it real. We should do, 
our own recruitment, encourage people to um, to try something classical, and just all of the old ways of doing things. I mean, this is a separate discussion, but it used to be people would buy subscriptions to uh, to, to the symphony or the yeah. opera, and they do to an extent, but not nearly as they used to. People are still going to the symphony and the opera, uh, but they'll make that decision maybe the day of, mm-hmm. and uh, that's a little stressier for the people who have to uh, who have to pay all the bills. Um, but again, that might be the new reality, and it's it's we have to find creative ways of continuing to support what we love, even knowing that the business model continues to shift. Well, and Michael and I were talking before before we turn this on. It's about the how in some ways. Uh, in a way, being a freelancer or a successful freelancer, someone with a lot of irons in the fire, you're almost more bulletproof in the in the uh, the music world in the in, in today's economy than someone who just has that one job. Because like you, I've I've had lots of friends and colleagues over the years who've been in the Savannah Symphony or the the you name it that that has disappeared, and all of a sudden they find themselves, you know. Unemployed, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, it, it gives um it, it gives a little bit of a, a little bit of a buffer. I mean, yeah. certainly if you lose something that was substantial, um, well at least you have that time, so mm-hmm. you could potentially fi- find something find something to fill it in. But at least it's not the catastrophe of yeah. all of the income di- disappearing a- at once. And I mean, much as I think that the the, the tax bill that that passed last year is an atrocity on so many levels, um. It's actually not going to have that big an impact on me personally because a lot of what, uh, well, our colleagues, you know, our colleagues who'd played in the Chicago Symphony or San Francisco Symphony, yeah, they just saw their tax bill go up. No question. There are a lot of their deductions yeah. that disappeared. Um, having this really variegated sort of, uh, uh, you know, very complicated tax return um, means that there's um, – there's uh, there's enough where I'm salaried, and there's enough where I'm uh, in the gig economy where I can still write some some things off. And especially now that my home is a hotel, I'm <laughs> I can write all sorts of things off. So uh, so you know, I, it's it's I, I wouldn't say that I, I wouldn't recommend this to the you know don't try this at home, kids. It's it's like it's like <laughs> this isn't you know dealing with a lousy tax bill is not a reason to embrace the freelance lifestyle. But if you're someone with a lot of interests and who likes playing with a lot of different people or in a lot of different styles or, or things like that. Um, I can see the freelance lifestyle as being something that's more, um, has more possibilities to it. If, if you're that person who has, has all those interests, less opportunity for burnout, which unfortunately we see all too often in a, in a symphonic situation. So um, it's pretty great. And you never know, what's going to come out of a freelance job. I remember playing a church gig years ago that, I don't know, I was paying $70 a service, something like that. And uh, we were doing some oratorio where um, the uh, the trombones were you know, playing, um, or uh, I don't remember what the piece was, but, um, you know, maybe Haydn's creation or something, but the trombones were, you know, the, the bass trombone would play the, the bass is the tenor trombone with the tenors, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, playing the same lines as I was, I remember this is one of my points of pride, this uh, bass trombonist uh, who shall remain nameless, um, started rushing. So <laughs> I, I pinched away at my strings and pulled out a massive sound and pulled him back into place. And I, I'm sure this guy, well, I was convinced at the time that this guy was thinking, you know, who the hell is this guy? And what, <laughs> What, is, what does he think he's doing? Well, as it turns out, that $75 a service gig, this church gig, led to one of the most prestigious and fulfilling opportunities that I had because I, um, when, when the Silk Road Ensemble was first just starting out and it was called the Silk Road Project, um, they were doing a tour around the States and they were going to go back to D.C. and have their final concerts at the Smithsonian Folkways Festival. As we know, of course, since then, it's spun off it's become a full you know a really yeah. full-time kind of thing and a, and a great ensemble but in these early years i was actually recommended by that bass trombone player to um someone who he knew who had been a trumpet player who was working for the silk road project and was doing the engagement of musicians in the various places so the core group of the silk road ensemble came out to northern california and they needed certain additional instruments for for some pieces and i was asked asked to be the bass player when we did the concerts at uc berkeley and stanford and um that by itself would have been fantastic just to get the opportunity to play with yo-yo and play with the silk road ensemble but um turns out it worked 
pretty well. They asked me to do some other things. So I, I went and did a couple of other opportunities, a West Coast tour with them, a concert at the Hollywood Bowl, but kind of most magically going on the Silk Road. We did a, a 10-day tour in Central Asia. And again i had to i had to bring the stuff at that first opportunity when when i played otherwise i wouldn't have been reengaged but i never would have had that opportunity had i not set that bass trombone player <laughs> on the rhythmic straight and narrow at a 75 dollar a service church gig and getting that recommendation so you never know this episode is brought to you by Diderio Strings. Our friends at Diderio want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Apply graphite, like pencil lead, to the bridge and nut, the contact points of the string, to ensure the strings slide smoothly on their way up to tension. This prevents them from getting stuck and unwinding or pulling the bridge so that it leans. Learn more at orchestral.diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And I've always been impressed by how Steve manages to get basses sounding so vibrant, whether it's a student-level bass or a top-of-the-line professional bass. Here's Steve on some of what he has learned in terms of setup. When steel strings came into general use around 1959, the German bass makers flipped out, and they really got scared that they're going to get big shiploads of bases back that got wrecked by these high-tension steel strings. And so they did three things that really changed the function of the instrument. They shortened the string length, and they lowered the neck angle so the bridges weren't that tall anymore. And then they made the tops a lot thicker. They really wanted to ensure that these bases were not going to come back across the ocean uh, for work anymore. And so the bases tend to sound kind of nasal, and they didn't have any depth. They didn't have a chest voice at all. Yeah. You know, and so what we do with increasing the neck angle, and we can also increase the overstands for modern playing, can get up into thumb position a lot easier. So a neck reset can accomplish that. Sometimes we'll transplant a neck or make a new neck for these bases that might have a string length that are not friendly to modern playing. Learn more about what Steve can do to get your bass playing better and check out his great selection of basses at steveswanstringbass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. I, I mean, I guess what, what I would say to, to people younger than, than I, and I, I do see this, people who are starting out as freelancers, and they might have gone to a pretty fancy conservatory, and they might have just played some you know swanky summer festival at, at, at Tanglewood or Yellow Barn or something like that. And some of those people jet set right into a prestige sort of appointment or thing. Um, most don't. And hopefully to make a, a sustainable life in, in music, you have to treat everything like it's going to be... Mm -hmm. Tanglewood and Yellow Barn and not just assume whatever. And, and all too often I will hear 20 somethings being disdainful of the gig they're on. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, don't do that because this is your career right now. And it doesn't mean that this has to be your career forever, but this is what it is right now. And if you are a special musician, bring your special qualities to, mm -hmm. um, to, to that job because it could lead to a fantastic opportunity later. But I think even more importantly, you'll drive yourself crazy if you don't um if you don't embrace what you're doing in the moment and try to make it the very best quality thing that, that it is now sounds a little pollyanna-esque i know there are times when i'm at a gig and you know the, the hall is a dump and you're not being paid enough and people are being super unprofessional and you know there's a conductor who's really you know abusive and th there's so many things that, yeah. that that can turn a gig potentially into a nightmare but be strong bass players. <laughs> <Just> be strong. <laughs> Keep it from being a nightmare. And so, uh, again, sorry, that was unsolicited advice. But but it's, uh, I think the fact that I've had longevity and lots of interesting opportunities um, in this field, um, it's not, it's, it, it's not all just sort of like talent and, 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 you know, hard work and, and achievement. It's, it's also about, you know, in your attitude and yeah. em embracing the, uh, the opportunity that you have at that moment. And yeah, look at that. Uh, can I, uh, can I curse on this? I won't curse. Yeah. Look, <laughs> look at that. Not so good gig. I was going to use, yeah, yeah. You use a different <laughs> word there. Look at that. Not so good gig as you know, it's another concert opportunity. And actually, sorry, I'm, I'm on my rant now, but I, I, I know that I have played jobs like that that don't 
look promising. And then you're at the concert and, you know, maybe it's not the highest quality professional job you've ever played. Maybe some of the players aren't all that. Maybe it doesn't sound that great. But you can look out in the audience and see people who are immensely touched yeah. by that experience in a way that they might not be by something that would be um, this absolute, you know, Apollonian ideal of whatever, like like it's got to be the Berlin Philharmonic all the time. It's not going to be the Berlin yeah. Philharmonic all the time. But there, that same person might not be touched in the same way by the Berlin Philharmonic in the way that they're being touched at that very moment by, you know, the, the job that might not be paying so well, that's poorly lit, that, you know, we, we can, I don't have to go back into all of the things that can, can go wrong at a, at, a, at a job. And, you know, and it's fun to talk like jazzers and call it a gig and this, that, and the other. But I would also suggest that maybe sometimes we do a subtle shift and use a different language. And instead of it being a gig, call it a concert. Or call it an engagement, or call it, mm. you know, so say, they, they, or call it a a, a project. Call it, they, just talk about something in a way that uh, ennobles it, even if yeah. it, um, e e even if it's something that's that's really you know <laughs> a little bit ignoble. Um, you know, just just try to try to find that that opportunity to uh, make it worthwhile. And then uh, you know, not only will it probably sound better because you'll sound better, and you might inspire people around you to sound better, um, but you'll be a lot happier. Yeah. So that is my that is my advice. Yeah. The psychiatrist is in. <laughs> It's Five a great, cents, please. It's a great uh no, it's great. And just really being professional and really showing up and you never like you said, you never know where those opportunities I think about my life and the bizarre great opportunities that have come out of the, uh similar gigs and right. you just you never know i gotta ask what was it like working with yo-yo ma and getting to meet yo-yo ma what i I've, I've i've played a few concerts with him but i've never i've certainly never done anything in a like, more small ensemble yeah and it's like, um well he's even if you play with yo-yo in a in a symphonic setting he's just yeah. the world's best person. I mean, he's not he's not only a great cellist, but just the 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 light that shines out of him, his humanity, it's it's always there on display wherever you are. Uh with with uh, with, with something. So, I uh actually the first time I ever played with him was with the New York String Orchestra seminar in Oh, what was that? It was um, 1984, something okay. like that. <laughs> something a really long time ago. And we did we did Brahms double, and it was with um, it, it was with Isaac Stern, who at that point was maybe not in quite as good shape. But I also think that, I mean, Stern was a magnificent violinist, a magnificent yeah. musician, and really could go to you know talking about the structure of the piece and you know this this it, it was a fantastic opportunity to play with him as well. But the contrast between Someone who is um, a little more rough-edged and 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 um, severe in the way that Isaac Stern could be, and then having Yo-Yo at the time, who was just um, all smiles and shining light and and gorgeous cello sound. Uh, there, there was um, you know that was already an inspiration, and everyone just fell in love with Yo-Yo at that point. But again, that's playing not in a huge orchestra, but still in an orchestral setting. So, um, getting to play in a group of you know, maybe eight people, nine people. Um, yeah, it just it just takes that same experience and and magnifies it and 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 really enhances it. And he's just the most amazing person. I mean, even in a symphonic setting, you know, Yo Yo five years later will will you know see your kid and say, oh, when they get their braces off, you know, like he'll remember yeah, that kind of de de detail. So so he's um and w he's way more diplomatic than I. I mean, I know he's got very strong opinions about things but he's also a superstar and and kind of has to uh mind p's and q's but i don't think he even thinks about minding p's yeah. and q's it's just it's just who he is i mean just really um salt of the earth lovely person <laughs> who just happens to be you know this fantastic cello genius um and well he also has this incredibly open spirit when we were on the on tour in central asia i said i i asked him i said you know where you are in your career, if you just wanted to go and play Dvorak Schumann concerto and, you know, the, play Bach suites and do, you know, the, like the Beethoven sonatas, you know, if, if you just wanted to do that and not have to do it, that would be going fine. You'd, yeah. be, you'd be booked 20 years out. It, it, would, it wouldn't be a, a problem. And, and um, of course, we know that he has this um, 
incredible, just insatiable appetite for for new experience and new new musical experiences. Um, it's the bluegrass album, the the Brazilian album. You, you, you know, you name it. He he's he's done it. But what happened? I think with well, what he told me with the Silk Road thing was he said, um, "Yo Yo's about ten years older than I am." Sorry to reveal your age, there, <laughs> Yo Yo, but, uh, but but he but he he said to me, you know, in our lifetimes there are going to be nine billion people on this planet. How are we going to make this work? And so if you look back in history uh, at, you know, an era and a place where uh, there was cultural exchange and people made it work, it was this sort of fascinating era of, of, of trade between East and West on, on the Silk Road. So he thought, let this be a template. Mm. Let's bring musicians from this Western tradition into um, – into contact with um, all of these people from these Central Asian traditions and see what kind of fruitful things can come out of it. And, um, well, like I said, it was going to be the Silk Road Project. That was the idea. And the Silk Road Project has become an ongoing thing and yeah. with the ensemble and, you know, generating new music by composers and, and more cultural exchange. And um, it's really... Uh, pr pretty... I mean, I, I feel really privileged to have been um, been a part of that. But that... For Yo-Yo and his interest in it, it came from um, something that's real. Like, how how are we going to make this work? How are we going to yeah. live together? Let's let's let this be um, let's let this be a template. I remember one discussion we had when uh, just among the musicians of, of the ensemble, where uh, this amazing tabla player Sandeep Das, who still plays with them a lot, Sandeep was saying, "Oh, you guys in the Western tradition, you have it all over us. You know, you have this, you know, the, the, the written down music and these schools of technique and these conservatories, and it's all fantastic." And meanwhile, we were all saying, are you kidding? We're you know, completely tied to the page. You know, We need someone waving a stick in our face. I mean, not exactly, but there, there's, there's that element of it. We're so dependent on that, whereas you're, um, it's so ingrained in you, your, um, your technique, and it's so connected to, um, to culture and to experience and spirituality. What you do is so much better. And you know, the truth, as with many things, lies somewhere in between. We are great in the West at complexity. You know, you can put a Mahler symphony together in three or four rehearsals, and it's an incredibly comp complex thing. But that's because all of these people are exquisitely trained with these, you know, centuries-old schools of technique. We all have a generally agreed-upon way of, you know, looking at these patterns that the conductor is giving or, or, or not giving. Um, we... Uh, know the sort of protocol of of um, hierarchy within an orchestra, things like that. It doesn't necessarily sound very sexy, but what that enables us to do is put something on like that, in, and it can be really amazing, really uh, very complicated, uh, ultimately very deep and very moving um, in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. The the approach that people will have in more traditional musics, it's um uh it's kind of like the slow food movement. I mean, <laughs> you really have to take your time with it, and this can be years. I mean, people who are playing, you know, who are playing ragas, who are uh, who, who are playing sitar and Indian classical violin, people will sit in a circle, tuning for twenty minutes, but then they're hearing. I'm not even sure how many microtones that are are just so much harder for us to hear, um, coming from this basic like uh you know diatonic scale with with um with 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 a, a grand piano overlay that, that 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 we have so both things are, are are great you know that 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 incredible acuity that they have for listening that um freedom of being off the page yeah. and still being able to 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 rep, you know represent a tradition that can be centuries old is really marvelous too so i think that's part of the idea of 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 that and it's by no means the only effort to you know have east meets meets west or north meets south but um i, I would say more please let's let, let's yeah. let's do that kind of thing as, as much as we can try to draw from that very deep connection to to playing that they have in their their tradition and you know if there if there are tips that that we'll have for systems of notation for 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 example for uh or or method books for traditional instruments. Why not? In fact, Sandeep was, was working on, on, on that very thing for tabla. That's great. That's great. Yeah. There's a, there's a bassist named Haggai Belitsky, a uh, Israeli bassist. Mm -hmm. He teaches in Jerusalem and he's made his, his life's work, or at least up to this point, exploring Middle Eastern music 
you know, on, on the base in all these different ensembles. And I sat down and did an interview with him in Italy a few weeks ago. And it's just, it's, it was so interesting to just kind of get into that world, which is a, not a familiar world for me, but, but, uh, and how just even like, well, we, the concept of harmony or something like that is just now they, they just don't think no. that way. It, it's, it's this more linear. Exactly. And, and Haggai as an example, he put all these notations on the page so we can see him, but he said, he's like, nobody would ever do what I'm doing right here. Right. This is like a completely artificial, you know, capturing just for your, uh, sort of Western, you know, sensibilities of learning. Right. Yeah. Now, so what, what is his training? Is his tra training a more traditional sort of traditional classical thing? classical? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Traditional classical, but he got into it and, and, you know, part of it is, is where he lives, you know, in, you know, in the Jerusalem area and, and, and just explain. Uh, the the school that he teaches at the Jerusalem Academy of oh I sorry Haggai listen so shout out to Haggai and sorry I'm butchering <laughs> the actual institution but they have they have a lot of uh, Arabic students mm -hmm. there as well as Israeli students and, and and just attempting to kind of bridge that gap and it really is like two two musical silos they don't talk to each other you know and, right. and so he's been uh working to bridge that gap and it's really exciting it's so cool i i, I share a super quick yo-yo ma and isaac cern story since you brought it up that i've never shared on this but so i used i actually still play in this group called the iris orchestra mm -hmm. in memphis tennessee michael stern's the conductor right so while isaac was still alive he was scheduled to do a concert with us he passed away uh, just a few weeks before the concert but so they got a replacement, which was Yo-Yo Ma, Emmanuel Axe, and Jamie Laredo all <laughs> coming in to play uh, Beethoven. The triple. triple. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then that so that was the Saturday night, the Friday night, which would have been the rehearsal with Isaac. Michael Stern did this retrospective of his dad. And it was really interesting. It was like one of those. I was really glad to be there for at that moment. Yeah. At yeah. that moment. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure that was really moving. And he was uh, I mean, what an extraordinary figure. I, I don't mean to dis Isaac. It was more just that first opportunity we had in the New York String Orchestra um, to connect with with yo yo and yeah. that his approach was um was all sunshine and <laughs> i'm sure that there was sunshine that came out of isaac stern but it wasn't all sunshine yeah and um yeah. and and that's just a you know just a, a one of one of the little differences but we need we need musicians to be to, to be different um i'm certainly not all sunshine but <laughs> but, but i i, I uh, uh and i i don't i don't think we could i don't i don't think we could have Everyone be all sunshine all the time. Uh, you know, all storm clouds gets a little a little tiresome. You know, you need the sunshine to, to poke through, peek through once in a while. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I'm I'm glad there's a yo yo out there to be that 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 beacon. Um, but that's cool. So, so you're still playing with Iris. I still play with Iris going down this fall, and I play nice. infrequently. I I quit for seven years to go take, or more like eight or nine years to go take a full time job, and right. so I came back. Uh, but I go play once or twice a year but nice. i always enjoy it it's, uh -huh. it's great a lot wonderful orchestra and great friends and colleagues and 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 part of what we've been talking about the the diversity of experiences i it's really fun to like get on a plane and go to memphis tennessee and eat some barbecue and hang out and then come back here to the bay area and do some teaching and do so i i have that uh, that restless spirit mm -hmm. spirit that i think you you do as well absolutely um and this is so much fun and they and there's no way we could possibly cover all, all that we could cover so we have to have you back but i, I gotta ask i usually ask or, or kind of start to wrap up with advice for young michael if you could go back and talk to juilliard pre-college michael or or columbia and from from your vantage point now any words of wisdom or caution or life lessons you might share with him that's uh, hmm that's that's a good question i'm um i would say i'm i'm someone who's had a lot of opportunities getting along on on charm and talent for years <laughs> and years and i think i would tell lazy ass michael sorry just cursed <laughs> that's a, to a spend fun. a little more time in the practice room because while you you know while your charm and talent are considerable and they might take you for there's actually no substitute for mm -hmm. just you know doing doing the work and i i found later uh when i have gotten into you know major so and i don't feel like i'm a natural practicer but there have been times when i've really gotten done with practicing and there is something uh 
I don't know, meditative mm -hmm. about it. And when you can go deeply into something, it's really satisfying. So I would say, you know, you know, 19 year old Michael, put down that beer. First of all, you're not <laughs> old enough to be drinking it and go back to your dorm room and practice. That's the advice I would give. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Michael today, uh, educator, bassist, conductor, vocalist, Airbnb super host. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for chatting. Really, really great to spend some time in person. And it was my again. pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>Michael, thank you so much for chatting. What a cool career you've got. And if you'd like to learn more about what Michael's up to, and it's a lot, as you heard from that conversation, we've got links to everything at our website, ContrabassConversations.com. Com. And there you can find our archives of over 500 shows at this point, spanning over a decade, covering, uh, I think we're up to 45 different countries at this point on the podcast. And highlight episodes, advice on auditioning, practicing, jazz technique, business development, you name it, we've covered it on the podcast. And we do this all for you. So thank you so much for listening. It really means a lot. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, it's totally free. I know the word subscribe sounds like you're spending money. You're not. Uh, you can subscribe in a ton of different ways. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We have an app you can download for iOS, Android, and Kindle. And you can get on our email list. And you can do that regardless of how you get the podcast, by the way. And we send out each Friday an email about what's going on in the base world, who we've talked to on the podcast, all that kind of stuff, a little bit of personal stuff from yours truly. So it'd be great to have you on that journey. And speaking of email, you can contact me and let me know who you'd like to hear on the show, what topics you'd like to cover, what you had for dinner last night, whatever you want to tell me, that's, that's fine. Feedback at ContrabasConversations.com is how you can get in touch with me. And I respond to each and every email. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Mitch is making great bases in the Dallas, Fort Worth area. Learn more at his website, MitchMooring.com. And I'm your host, Jason Heath, coming to you each and every week from San Francisco, California. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Uh -huh.